Well, that's true. I graduated from Calvary Baptist Academy in 1979. Uh, there were two of us in my graduating class. I was the second in my class. <laughs> and that other guy, he was next to the last. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, I've been here a long time and I'm always happy to come back here and see all the improvements and the changes. You know what's great? is to come here on a Wednesday night and see what in many churches is bigger than a Sunday morning crowd. And that thrills me, and I'm happy to see you. I know a lot of you uh, for many, many years. Some of you are kind of new to me. And uh, if you're new to me and you don't know me, see me after church, I'll borrow $20 from you because I'm leaving the country. (laughs) Amen? You don't know me yet. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to show you some new pictures tonight. And these new pictures are really specifically about uh, my last expedition into Haiti. Now, the, the border closed just shortly after I came back. A couple weeks after I came back, they, the border closed. They've been having trouble between the two countries like normal. It hasn't reopened yet. So if I want to go to Haiti now, I have to fly to Miami and then fly back to Port-au-Prince. I cannot cross the border uh, legally right now. Uh, but this last expedition that we had uh, was really, in all my years, I, uh, it's the toughest expedition I've ever had. I enjoy the expeditionary type evangelism where we go out uh, into the real remote areas of the island. <clears throat> We've done that many times, and uh, this was actually about the toughest trip uh, that I ever took. So I'm going to show you some of these pictures. Now, this area up here, you see where it says Retel area. That's the area that I went to in Haiti, and you go into that area. There's uh, no electricity. There's no way to get a vehicle in there. Uh, there's no uh, cell phone signal up there. If you want to talk on a cell phone, you've either got to climb to the top of the mountain or you've got to go way down around to where the river turns where you can get a signal from the town of Tibuco Boy. And it was the toughest trip uh, that I've ever taken. Uh, we left, uh, left Harbacoa, Joshua. My nephew took me to Santiago and dropped me off with four Haitians in Santiago. We took the public bus to... Uh, uh, Cape Haitian. We went into Cape Haitian, and from there we we uh, got picked up in a pickup truck from a pastor in a town called Limbe, <clears throat> and that took us all day. The border is a disaster, and then uh, we stayed uh, we stayed at the church in Limbe because we got there. It was already about dark whenever we got to the church in Limbe. So when we got into the church in Limbe, we spent the night, slept there at the church in Limbe. We got up uh, at about four in the morning, got the truck loaded. We, we took off to go to Tibuco Boy, but we couldn't get to Tibuco Boy because Cape Haitian, uh, there had been a gang operating there in Cape Haitian, and the police finally got together, and they had a big battle, and so they, the gang escaped, and they ran, and uh, they went over to Tibuco Boy, uh, which is the name of the village, and that's the trailhead that normally we would go into the area of Retel through Tibuco Boy. From Tibuco Boy, it's about a five-hour hike. <clears throat> and you kind of drive around the mountain range and you come down. And I would, if I had been able to go in from Tibuco Boy, I would have started <clears throat> and come in from the west to go up into this series of gorges where Retel is. And so in the morning, as the sun's coming up in the east, you start off in the shade. And also, you cross three or four rivers, so there's no worry about water. So that was really my original plan. So I only had a one quart canteen with me. But the gang had taken over the trailhead at Tibuco Boy. And so we couldn't go in that way, so we had to go in from another town on the east called uh, Port Margot. And Port Margot is on, the, is on the east side. And so from early in the morning, we were in the sunlight, and I had a one-quart canteen. From Tiboko Boy, we started about sea level, and we climbed up to 1,750 feet to where the church is. But over here from Port Margot, we started about sea level, and we've got to go over a 3,000-foot peak and then go down to uh, 1,750 feet. So it really wasn't on my plan, and so it was a very, very difficult trip. This is what the trail looked like. And uh, this was just constant, uh, this kind of a trail, very, very uh, difficult trail. Uh, Even though we had mules, the mules can't go on this trail. This trail is only for people. So we had myself and the four Haitians that went with me, and we had about 30 porters uh, to carry stuff. This is our trail. So you can see why you can't take a four-wheel drive or a motorcycle up. It's very, very difficult. Some places are just downright treacherous. And so this is the missionary from Calvary Baptist Church out there in the middle of nowhere. And um, <clears throat> walking along, wishing I had brought more water with me. and didn't have any salt with me. No, uh, there is a rest area. Let me show you the rest area. Oh, well, this is some more of the trail. And uh, here, here's... Uh, Here's some of our porters. You see what that man's carrying on his head? 
Imagine starting at sea level and going over a 3,000 foot peak with that thing. And I'll tell you what, it about killed me, but now I'm, I'm not used to doing it every day. These folks do this stuff every day. It's kind of embarrassing, you know, the white American, yeah, here I am, here I come. Some old lady goes trailing by me. Hi, Pastor. <laughs> oh, man, these people are killing me. One old guy said to me, and he's about 10 years older than me, he said, uh, Pastor, do you want to go back? I said, no, I don't want to go back. He said, well, you stopped. I said, I'm resting. I'm not racing. You guys are racing. I'm not in a race. <clears throat> Just let me rest. I, didn't, I was already like four hours into it. He says, you want to go back? Go back to where? The pickup truck that dropped us off left. Want to go back and wait for a week for the truck to come back? No, I don't want to go back. I want to get over this mountain. <clears throat> and a uh, rough trail. And uh, this is just what the trail looked like. And so uh, it was, the sun, man, it was a clear day, and the sun, the sun was just killing us. Here's the rest area. And uh, I was so thankful I had that big Exxon sign. No, none of that, you know. <clears throat> and I did. I stopped and drank myself some coffee, and I drank myself some milk, and I had some local bread. And uh, that was at about 1,700 feet above sea level. And I was already, I was already thinking, man, what I get into today when I got up that far? <clears throat> meeting a lot of people along the way. Thank goodness, a lot of them, they could tell I was in distress, and they brought me coconut water. Coconuts are great when you're like that, man. Drink that coconut water. That's a big help. Bring me fruit, and um, <clears throat> it, was, it was good. But this is, this is what the trail was like uh, for, for 11 hours uh, going over that trail. This is a spring. Well, I, I camped at that spring for a little while. Let me tell you, I drank, drank the rest of what I had in my canteen, filled my canteen up, drank it again because I was really dry by the time I got up there. And it's just 300 feet below the peak, and there's water coming out of the mountain up there. So that's what you call the Lord's provision. Amen? The Lord put that spring there a long time ago because he knew someday some dumb American would come up that mountain without enough water. The Lord's like, yeah, Wesley's going to come up this mountain someday. I've got to get some water up there for him so he don't die. <clears throat> but we got up there, and uh, after I got there, it was on a Saturday when I got up there, and uh, first off, I had to rest for a while. I rested for about an hour, <clears throat> but it was going to get dark, so we set up the tents. We had, we had uh, four tents with us, and we set up the tents, and this is where I stayed uh, the whole time I was up there. You can see I got a little cot inside there, my, my chair, and, and I had my little camp stove, and, and uh, this, is, this is how the missionary lives. You say, how does a missionary live on an expedition like this? Well, this is how I live on an expedition like that. And uh, that's, that's, that was uh, good enough. And uh, it kept the rain off of me. It rained some nights. It kept the rain off me. This is the camp kitchen. And uh, this camp kitchen fed us all week long. It was actually, the total trip was about a 12-day trip. They fed us the whole time uh, out of this little kitchen right here. And it was good food, a lot of good food. I had good food every day. Uh, I usually lose weight on a trip like that just because of all the walking, but it's not that I'm because I'm going hungry. It's because there's nowhere to go except for uphill and downhill. Everywhere you go, you're uphill and downhill. And, uh, of course, I had my own coffee kit with me because if I want coffee, they want to go in and stir up the fire and put on some more wood and go get some more water. It's like two hours to wait for a cup of coffee. So my, my 1946 gasoline stove will make me coffee in just a couple minutes. Amen. So again, the Lord provides, amen. So, and of course, we had parched corn. Parched corn was a very uh, was the treat pretty much every day. We had some of the local grown parched corn. They parched that, and we eat it. And um, some of the breakfast there, oatmeal for breakfast. We had a latrine at this stop, which is always good when you have a latrine. But of course, with a latrine, you have the spiders, you have the bugs, and and all the things that go with a latrine. But I'll tell you what, when you need a latrine, a latrine is good to have, amen. So uh, that was that was another blessing we had there. Uh, Want to iron your clothes? You get out that old cast iron iron and put some charcoal in it and iron your clothes. And this is how I had my clothes ironed when I was up there. And uh, <clears throat> we did have a, a, a good place to take a bath. It had cold and colder running water. And um, didn't have any cold and hot, but we did have cold and colder. And uh, it was also where we did our, did, did our laundry at, do it all up in this hole here up along the river, was just a little bit walk uh, away from where I was camped out at. So that's how the missionary lives when he's out on a trip like this. So what's the purpose of doing stuff like that? You know, actually, once I got in there, once I actually got in there, it wasn't too bad. The bad part was getting in and getting back out. It was a rough trip getting in and getting back out. <clears throat> a lot of this you see up there, a lot of marine fossils. Man, you're 3,000 feet up in the, in the sky, and here's marine fossils. And you look at that stuff, and you think, oh, wow, Genesis must be true. Amen? That's what I think. I look at that and think, yeah, God knows what he's doing. 
Uh, there's a well, that thing with all the sticks, that's actually a well. That's like 60 feet deep already, about as wide as this pulpit. And uh, they covered it up with some sticks for safety, amen? And that was right there by the church, hundreds of people walking around. <clears throat> a little cave there, which was on the way to where I went to take my bath every day. <clears throat> and this was the trail to visitation. I'd walk out of the church, go down the hill, and start going off in visitation all around the area. And there was a fallen tree across it, which had been there for quite a while. Nobody cared. And you just kind of go and duck under it and keep going on visitation. So uh, it, was, it was very good. We had uh, uh, just... You know, they'll say, it's over there. I say, is it far down the hill? Oh, no, it's not far down the hill. But to them, far, not far down the hill doesn't mean anything to me. Not far down the hill. It's like, yeah, go jump off the cliff. It ain't far, you know. <clears throat> and people about kill me. Especially, I tell you, those people, they do it all day, every day, and it don't mean nothing to them. You saw the guy carrying the generator. They carried, we rented a sound system. They carried giant speakers up there, as big as this pulpit. They go up the hill. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I just, I just amazed at it. You know, me, I'm like, I'll talk louder. You don't have to carry all that stuff up there, but they do. So what we did, we had visitation every day and open-air church services every night. We, every night we had more than 250 people, even on the nights when it rained. And some of those people walk for hours to get there. Some of those people will start walking hours ahead of time. And the whole time you're preaching, we start in the daylight. You see, this picture was taken in the daylight, but we go till well after dark. And people just keep coming uh, the whole time. And uh, we only shipped in, we uh, hiked in uh, 28 uh, gallons of gasoline. So with the 28 gallons of gasoline, what we'll do is once we got church going, uh, we'll refill so we don't run out during church. Because we had a sound system, we had strings of lights up there, and uh, we'll refill it. And then after the service is all done, then they all sing until the generator runs out of gas. You, gotta, you, you can't let them sing until they're done singing and then preach. If you do that, you're never going to preach, okay? They're going to sing till midnight, and the generator's going to run out of gas. So usually you just have them sing for about an hour and a half. Then you go into the message, you preach to them for about an hour and a half, and then they sing a bunch more. And uh, they don't want no short sermon, and they don't want no short song service. Imagine if you're going to walk two hours to church to have a one-hour service and walk two hours home. You ain't getting no bang for your buck out of that, you know, and especially in the rain and not enough seats. Some of them stand up the whole time. Look at all these people standing. We had benches over there. A lot of people that live close by, they carry chairs, but we didn't have enough benches for everybody. A lot of people stand up the whole time. And so we'll go and we'll have church, and so then we'll let them sing till the lights go out. When the lights go out, everybody goes home because there's no more electric, no more sound system. But we had over 250 people present every night. We had about 500 uh, the last night. We have two mules up there to carry in building supplies. Uh, the, these are the two mules. They're both four-wheel drive. Amen? Got to have four-wheel drive up there. <clears throat> and uh, low maintenance. And, uh, you know, they've just got all kind of advantages. That little one, is uh, name is Tibato. Tibato means little boat. And uh, that's his name is Tibato. And actually right there, what I'm doing there, that's actually on uh, Saturday morning. We was, I was carrying up the supplies uh, for the wedding. We had, we had a wedding. We had six married couples at one time, six wedding couples at one time in a church. And he's carrying up some of the supplies that we had hauled in because we took in about 30 cases of soda pop. We took in two wedding cakes. They were only single-layer wedding cake, but they were about that big. And, and they made it pretty good. They made it in pretty good shape. And uh, we took in two wedding cakes to be shared. <clears throat> we carried in other things. This a man with an accordion, carried that accordion in there and gave it to a man in one of the churches up there. And uh, he was, here he was playing for me and showing me that he could play it and all that. And so we gave him that, carried in packs of Bibles and uh, gave away free Bibles to the people. And uh, these Bibles are shipped in from an outfit called Beams. And I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but they provide free Bibles to missionaries. They ship them to me, and I'm able to take them then and give those out and gave this guy here a Bible, and he was very happy there to have his Bible. Some of the kids bringing me their report cards to get their rewards. I'll take a bunch of stuff in there, and they have good grades. I'll give them a reward for it. So they're bringing me their report cards. That's the government school right there. So uh, you, you can see that they are trying, uh, but they, they bring me their report cards and show me their grades this is the wedding day. Uh, there's three of them you can see right there on one side, but there's three on the other side also of the aisle uh, that we put there. And that piece of gray stuff on the floor, that's a big roll of carpet that we took up there and put it down the middle of the church for the wedding day. And they decorated that up. You can see all those decorations. And uh, they, they really went all out for that. A lot of them went uh, down to town and bought extra things and so on. So we had a great big day. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is on the beginning of the last Sunday that we were there. We had eight days of services. We had nearly 40 people saved and a bunch of other decisions too in that period of time. And so that's what it's all about, amen? 
<laughs> and so that's what it's all about right there. That's what it's for. Amen. And so uh, you've got some things here. Now, this is the existing church in Retail, Haiti. Uh, this picture here is in, on, during Sunday school. Uh, and then the other picture, that's taken on the outside. Like those piles of sand there, my two mules carry that sand up from the river and pile that sand up. And we buy concrete. They're making concrete block. They make the block one at a time. And then uh, we're doing this. This found, Here's the foundation it's in. All that stone was carried up. All that steel you see laying there was carried all the way from town, miles and miles away. And they get about six rolls, uh, six bars or ten bars of that steel and bend it around in a big old curve and put that on the back of the mule. And the mule has to drag that up the mountain and get up there with all that steel. That's how they got all that steel up there. And uh, the concrete goes up. One mule carried two bags in. And they can do that about three or four days a week. <clears throat> There's the building plan we have. It'll eventually have 30 columns in it. You can see we have the bases under some of the columns and all that. And it's just an ongoing, a long-term project. It'll take a while to get it all done. But it'll be, because getting them saved is one part. That's one part of the work. Getting that church established is another part. Amen. So we try to do it all. I mean, I really enjoy the expeditionary part of it. I enjoy doing it. But this right here is what you got to have done. You got to have a church that's established there uh, in that area. <clears throat> then after, uh, on the final day, we sent, uh, on Sunday, uh, we sent a spy down the mountain, uh, down to Tubuco Boy to see could we go out by Tubuco Boy, but he come back up and said, no, the gang still has control of the riverfront down there where we need to go and be picked up. So we had to hike back out the same way, climb back up over the mountain, go back down, and by the time we got all the way down to the bottom of the mountain, uh, the pickup truck was there to pick us up. And uh, we went back to the town of Limbe, but we got back too late to make it to the border. The next morning, we're up at 4, get all everybody loaded up by 5, and uh, we headed back uh, toward the border. When we got to the border, I had to hike across the border. So I hiked across the border about a half mile down into town, and I usually carry about a 70 to 80 pound pack because I like to live good, you know. I like to have my stove and all that stuff and my cot and my, you know. I'm in there for quite a few days, so I want to live pretty good. I don't really suffer that much. At least, at least it ain't suffering to me. I mean, some of you folks that might be suffering too. You don't really suffer to me. I got my cot, I got my chair, you know, and I'm, I'm all right. A couple bars of soap. You know, a bar of soap's a great thing, yeah. you know. Let me tell you, you get into day two or day three of that hot, sweaty stuff, that bar of soap comes in handy. And soap is also shaving cream. Soap is shampoo. Soap is toothbrush. And soap is laundry soap, man. It works for everything. You take a couple big bars of soap in, because soap is basically soap. Uh, whether it doesn't have perfume or coloring in it or whatever, it's soap. And so I carry a pretty heavy pack and I had to hike about a half a mile uh, from the border down into town, jump on that bus. The bus took me down into Santiago and missionary Joshua Lane picked us up. And so that was, that was my latest really big expedition into Haiti. <clears throat> but I like here in Luke chapter 15, and remember because we're going to touch on this in a little bit, in verse 7, where somebody who was lost, he says, likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Joy, where? My house? No, in heaven. Because somebody repented and came to Jesus Christ as Savior. So we thank you for your prayers. We thank you for your support. And we pray that you'll continue to do your job here. Amen? Amen. 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 Open up your Bible in the book of Romans, chapter 10, please. Now, the preacher told me I have to be done by 1030. Well, actually, he didn't put a time limit on me. You didn't tell me that, did you? You said there ain't no time limit. Amen. There ain't no time limit. But I drove my mom's car over. <laughs> I'm like a teenager, but I drove my mom's car over, so I got to go home. Amen. <laughs> If my mom comes up here and grabs me, I really can't do nothing to battle. So don't do that to me, mom. Please don't come up here and grab me. It's time to go. Romans chapter 10. This is a familiar verse of scripture. But this, this really come to me as I was preparing this message and, and looking at these different verses of scripture combined with talking to some of these people who have kind of, I, I don't think they read the Bible. I don't think they pray that they're kind of going towards uh, what they call, uh, they always come up with new words to avoid saying I'm in sin. Uh, um, reformed theology, that's the word I'm looking for. That's called Calvinism. They don't want to call it that. And I always, I always think about this, and I, I get into the Bible, and I start studying it, and I find out that, you know, that's just not what the Bible teaches, amen? And so here, in the book of Romans chapter 10, very familiar verse of Scripture, in verse number 13, it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall what? Be saved. Amen. And who's, who's that go to? That goes to whosoever. Amen. Whosoever is a big word. 
That'll fit you right in there. Whosoever, everybody fits in that word, whosoever. There's room in whosoever for you. And I, and I look at that and I, I think about these guys who, who want to talk about Calvinism. And it's unfortunately, some Baptist preachers have fallen into that where they fall into this Calvinistic idea that, that God had predetermined before the beginning of the world that some people are just going to absolutely go to hell no matter what. God did not decide that. What God decided was whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then you'll go talking to these guys, especially, you know, this used to be a, a familiar argument many, many years ago, and now some people are starting to try and arouse it again. Are you a Calvinist or an Armenian? I guess I'm a Calvinian. I don't know what I am because I'm not one of those, you know. You know, the fact of the matter is that the free will of man exists. We know that because we do dumb stuff all the time. But the sovereignty of God also exists, and they're both in the Bible. You know where they meet? They meet in the responsiveness of God. God will respond because it says right here, boy, this is a great verse for it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that person is going to be saved. That's God responding to someone calling upon his name. But then it goes on to say, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Now, I thank God for Calvary Baptist Church. This is a missions church. And I thank God for that because I'll tell you, there's a lot of churches around America that aren't missions churches. There's a lot of churches around America that don't really uh, have a good concept even of what missions is. A lady in Boston, old lady in Boston was telling me, well, our church has a missions program. And last year we gave $50 to the ladies' aid. And she was dead serious. Because you gave $50 to the ladies' aid. All of you women together did that? You should have called me. I would have just gave you that much money. My goodness, I'm my church. And at that time I was at a church up there. I said, that church is giving over $75,000 a year to missions. She said, no, that's not true. Oh, yeah. And this is a missions church here, and I thank you for that. But, you know, there's always, there's always people that aren't getting on board. They aren't doing what they can do. And, you know, doing what you can do not only includes doing what you're doing in the offering plate, but it includes doing what you're doing right here when you go across the street and invite someone to come to this church. Whenever you give your testimony, whenever you preach the gospel, how shall they preach except they be sent? How are they going to believe if someone preaches to them? How are they going to hear? How are they going to do any of that? When I go back in there in that mountain and I find these people that live way back in those mountains like that, and, and, you know, it's amazing that there's still places like that in the world. No electric, no cell phone, no vehicle traffic. Everything in there is foot traffic. And the only way that you're going to, the only way that those people are going to hear the gospel is if someone will go and tell them. And it's not just my island that has places like that. So when I, I look at that and, and I'm just looking at all these different places that we like to refer to as the Great Commission, if you want to talk about Matthew chapter 28, where it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. If you talk about Acts, or, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, where it talks about going into, into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. You want all these verses that we use, Mark chapter 16 verse 15, Luke chapter 24. Why did God give those commandments? He did that because God wants every person in this world to receive Jesus Christ. He wants everyone to be saved. That whole idea that God chose some to, to go to hell and some to go to heaven just ain't true. And you know what? It's not biblical. And I have yet to meet anybody who preaches that foolishness that doesn't think that they're one of the chosen ones. I've yet to meet a person that says, well, I'm out here on the corner drinking because I'm a Calvinist. God chose me to go to hell, so no use for me to live right. God chose me to go to hell. I never met one of them yet. They're all like this. Well, God chose me to go to heaven and all my kids too. Yeah. 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 Me and all my buddies and everybody at church. Sometimes we come to church and, and you know what happens? We get separated away from the world, which is great. Separation is great. And, uh, and, and we, we stop doing all the wicked things we were doing and we get faithful in the church and we start learning the word of God and sometimes we forget the pit from which we were dug. 
Because there's a whole world that needs Jesus Christ. You go over in the book of John, right in the very first chapter of the book of John. I want you to look at what the Bible says so you know that I'm getting this right out of God's Word. It says in John chapter 1, verse 29, when the last great prophet before Jesus came, the first prophet in 400 years, the God, uh, uh, John the what? Was he John the Presbyterian? I love it, man. I love the idea that Jesus was baptized by a Baptist. Ain't that good? And we know there's a lot of semantics in there and all that, but boy, it sure is fun to play with them when we're doing that. Amen. I have a lot of fun with that. But John the Baptist said this when he pointed to Jesus. It says in verse 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of a few people. Is that what it says? Huh? Take it away the sin of the elect. Jesus came to take away the sin of the whole world. Of the whole world. And then he gave us the job to go tell them. They don't know about it. And you know, you know, as we kind of go through all these trendy things over time and you hear all these trendy stuff. And I, I remember for a while the trendy thing was lifestyle evangelism. Remember that? That was, a, that was a key word. Lifestyle event. Just, just live your Christian life and let them see Jesus through you. I ain't against that. But if they don't know Jesus, they don't know what they're seeing. They're not going to see Jesus through you if they don't know Jesus. And certainly if Jesus don't know them. See, because it's not just, it's not just them... Knowing Jesus, we've got to help them get to where they have their relationship where Jesus knows them. We all know famous people, and the famous people don't know us. Now, if the big orange monster came in here tonight and talking like this and talking about just how great all of it was and, and, and all of his bombastic political things that he does, and, and, and we would all look and say, there's Donald Trump. We'd all know him, wouldn't we? I'd know him, but he wouldn't know me. He wouldn't come over and say, hey, Wes, how you doing? And that's the way the world is with Jesus. They all think they know Jesus, but Jesus don't know them. We've got to get these people into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it's, the Bible says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as, the manner, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. What's that mean? Man, that means he's waiting for us. He's putting up with us. He's just putting up with this old world. He's long-suffering to usward. Why? Why does God just put up with us? Here's why. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, people that want to talk about the sovereignty of God got to look at verses like that. Sure. There's the, there's the sovereign will of God. You know what the sovereign will of God is? He is not willing that any should perish. And he gave us the job to go there and tell them. In the book of 1 Timothy, in chapter 2, in verse number 4, the word of God says, I'm sorry, in verse number 14, I don't know where I'm at here. I'm in 2 Timothy. I got to go to 1 Timothy. Excuse me. I got in the wrong spot. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 and verse number 4. The Bible says, Who will have some men to be saved? Is that what it says in the Bible? Look in your Bibles. Because I'm going to tell you that little trick I'm doing right now, I hear preachers do that on the radio all the time. And all your new translations do that too. They just change it. That's what they do. I heard a guy the other day read a scripture verse. And, and I thought, I don't even recognize it. What in the world? Where did he read that from? He said, as the word of God says, and he, and he goes off on some kind of, I don't know what he was talking about, you know? That's why you got people out there who think that silly little sayings that we have, like cleanliness is next to godliness. They think that's in the Bible because they don't read the Bible. I heard a guy say that. Like the good book says, cleanliness is next to godliness. They go, no, I don't really say that. I don't really say that. Not even in my own version that don't say that. Here's what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. The word of God actually says, Who will have all men? 
to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. They need to know. Now go back to Romans where we were. How are they going to know if we don't go preach? And how are people going to go preach in places like Rattel, Haiti, in places like La Savannah, Dominican Republic, unless somebody sends them to go? The fact of the matter is I can't do what I do without Calvary Baptist Church. But Calvary Baptist Church can't go to the uttermost part of the earth without your missionaries. And so we need each other. Because I can't do what I should do without you, and you really can't do what you should do without me and your other missionaries. I thank God for men like Brother Sasser going to be going off to Israel. Going to Israel? Going to Israel. And people tell me I'm crazy for going to Haiti. Go to Israel, man. You got everybody around the whole. It's not just, you know, in Haiti and Dominica and they fight and there's gangs and all that. You know, we're just allowed to shoot them back, run from them, whatever. You know, where you're going, every country in the whole world wants to kill them. Thank God for people like that. You know why? Because it's when they get sent, that's when the word gets preached, that's when people hear, that's when they believe, and that's when they call on the name of the Lord. And God wants everyone to be saved. You know, a lot of times I preach out of uh, first, first John chapter 2, and I like First John chapter 2. I like those first two verses. They're so strong when it says, my little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And I, I use this a lot whenever I'm teaching about eternal security because he's writing to Christians. And then he says, and if any man sin, that means, oh, sometimes we might sin. Well, what happens? Do I lose my salvation? No, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. But when you get down to verse number two, it says, He is the propitiation for our sins. That means just the people right here that are already perfect in Calvary Baptist Church. Is that what that means? Just us Christians that are already perfect. Us four and no more. Got myself cleaned up. Now I'm good. Jesus died for me. No. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of who? The whole world. Yeah. All those billions of people over there in Asia, many of them that don't worship anything, many of them that worship false gods, many of them that, that have never traveled, never left their village, many of them that eat the same stinking thing every single day, fish and rice, fish and rice. Man, them people need to go to heaven. All the way down in the darkest parts of the jungles of Africa, the darkest parts of the jungles of South America, where people live, and I've, I've been down in the Amazon. Now, I've traveled down the Amazon a river in a boat, and I've spent the night in the native jungle there. And you talk about darkness, there's darkness. There's physical darkness, there's spiritual darkness, and Jesus died for every one of those people. You just turn right over into chapter of 4 of 1 John, verse number 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of who? Of the whole entire world. But how shall they preach except they be sent? Now, I don't know. I'm always praying that God can help people find the same connections in Scripture that He shows me when I'm studying. And I don't know if you do or not. But if you go back over to Luke chapter 15, and you find there the three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son. All three of those parables are about the value of one human soul. And those verses that I put on there, that next to the last slide, just before our picture, I put, I put this verse uh, on here. I put verse number... 6 and 7 of Luke 15. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And you know, he was happy. He was happy. He found that lost sheep, and he wanted to share that joy. And that's why when I show you pictures like that, I want to share that joy with you. Yeah, I had to go into the mountains to get them, but we found some of those lost sheep, amen? And I want you to rejoice with me. But more important than that is verse number seven. I say unto you, remember this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. 
that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. I have to tell you, when I do a trip like that, when I've, and I've done other expeditions like that, that was just the toughest one I've had to do because it was just so hard to get in there where we went. You know, but when I do a trip like that, and we start having our church services, and then people come down front to get saved, and I'm able to lead that person to the Lord from that very first one, I say, okay, now it was worth it. Now it was worth it. If nobody else comes this whole week, now it was worth it. Someday in heaven, I'm going to meet that person. You know, sometimes I meet people that got saved earlier in my ministry, and I'm kind of surprised because I didn't remember them. I had a guy that got saved the very first youth camp I did in Haiti. Now he's a pastor in a place called Quad Bouquet. And, and I remembered him because he was also faithful in church. But then when I was over in Haiti uh, several voyages ago, he said to me, uh, Brother Lane, you really don't remember me, do you? I said, sure, you're Pastor Claude. I know you. You're Pastor Claude. Why wouldn't I know you? I've known you for years. You came out of the church in City Soleil. No, no, you don't remember. Remember what? He said, I got saved at that youth camp where you were speaking Creole so bad. And I was, I was speaking it bad, you know. That's when I kept saying the, the theme was, the theme was supposed to be hold fast or hold firm. I kept saying hold your woman. And uh, because I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, them young people love that camp, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, they're going to thank God I'm a Baptist. Woo! Love this preaching. Yeah, I knew, I knew something was wrong. They finally told me what I was saying wrong, but by that time, it was too late. Anyway, he got saved at that youth camp, and he was in the very first group of people that I baptized in Haiti. Said, you don't remember that, do you? No. Said, yeah, I was in the first group of people you baptized. Said, I didn't know that. Yeah. You meet people like that. You know what's going to happen when we get to heaven? We're going to meet people like that. We might be there for a 1,000 years before we bump into them. They go, hey. You're the guy who gave me that gospel track. Yeah. Hey, you're the guy that, led, that, that said, come over to my church, and I went to your church, and I got saved. You might not even know it. We've got a guy right now that's faithful in our church named Sandy. And Sandy, uh, one time we were having young adults, and, and Sandy was there, and I said, okay, I want you to go around the room. I want each one of you uh, to give me your testimony how you got saved. Because sometimes I'm not really sure where they're at, and I want to know. So I want them to share, you know, and tell us. Because sometimes they come up with the craziest stories about how they got saved. It got nothing to do with getting saved. And so I said to him, uh, so when it come to Sandy, Sandy said, well, uh, we were over here at camp, at the youth camp. Pastor Wesley was here, and we had a church service. And Pastor Wesley said, if you'd like to pray to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, raise your hand. And I raised my hand. Pastor Wesley led me in a word of prayer, and I received Christ as my Savior, and I never forgot it. And I'm still saying, you know, it's been years ago. He's still faithful today. When he told me that, I didn't even remember that I had led him to the Lord. Do so you mean you got saved under my ministry? Yeah. Oh, well, a good thing God's keeping track. Amen? But I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says this. There will be joy in heaven over one sinner. The Bible says that again in verse number 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. You know, when someone walks down this aisle and gets down on their knees and says, God, I know I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. Please forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Come into my heart and be my personal Savior, Lord. I give my life to you. And give me that eternal life. Now, if you haven't ever done that, you can do that tonight. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> every day is a good day to get saved. But every time somebody does that, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God in heaven. The angels are going, whoa, another one. Amen. Snatched another one from the jaws of the devil. And that's why we do what we do. That's why your pastor does what he does. That's why these other missionaries do what they do. And that's what I do, why I do what I do. Because the Lord wants everyone to be saved. And just like the father in the story of the prodigal son, God is there waiting with his arms wide open. And whenever one comes, he says, bring thither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry for this. My son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found. And they began to make merry. You realize that happens in heaven every time someone gets saved? You get all the way down to verse 32. It says, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad. 
For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Boy, just like that song, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And I want to tell you something. That joy is a joy that you and I should have. And that desire to see those people get saved is a desire that you and I should have, not just way out in Rattel, but right here at home. It's not hard to do. You can give out a gospel track. You can say, hey, come to church with me tonight. You can even, you can even play the old I'm disabled, crippled thing and say, you know, I really need to go to church tonight, but I don't feel like driving. Can you drive me to church and sit with me? Amen. Most neighbors that might say, no, I don't want to go to church might help you if you just ask them. Drive me to church tonight. Amen? <clears throat> Relatives, friends, people you work with. Listen, the burden that you have right here is how, how strong that burden is is going to determine how far around this old world it reaches. Okay? You got no burden here, that burden will never reach Haiti and never reach the Dominican Republic and never reach Israel. But if you have a strong burning desire to win the lost here, that burden will reach all the way around the world. So the whole question after all of this is this. What are you doing? What are you doing tonight? What are you doing Sunday to Sunday? What are you doing every day when you meet that person where you buy your coffee, where you go to the bank, that person you work with, that neighbor that you say hi to? What are you doing? to bring that joy in the presence of the angels of the Lord because all of us can do something. God is not willing that any should perish. And all those familiar verses that we do to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, huh? to go you therefore into all nations, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part, that, those commandments are exactly because God is not willing that any should perish. But he gave that job to me and he gave that job to you. My question to you tonight is, what are you going to do about it? Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please, tonight. Heads bowed and eyes closed. There may be somebody here this evening, and while the preacher was preaching, the Holy Spirit of God spoke to your heart. You may be sitting here tonight, and say, Brother Shefflin, I'm not sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I hope I'd go. I think I would. But I don't know for sure. I don't have 100% certainty that if I died tonight on the way home from church, I'd go to heaven. And I'd like for you to pray for me. I'd like for you to remember me in prayer. I wonder tonight, would you be concerned enough about your soul with heads bowed, eyes closed, folks all over the altar praying? Would you be concerned enough and be honest enough tonight to slip your hand up where I can see it, just right where you're at. Just lift it up where I can see it. Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Pray for me. Would you slip it up where I can see it? If I see it, I, you can put your hand right back down. Anybody anywhere? I see that hand. God bless you. You can put it down. I see that hand. God bless you. You can put it down. Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. What a tremendous honor it would be for us tonight to help you get that settled. There's nothing greater there's no greater decision or choice. This morning, we spent probably an hour and a half in staff meeting praying for God to burden our church members to get involved in soul winning. We talked about it. I leaned over while the preacher was preaching. I said, it's like Brother Lane was in our staff meeting this morning. Begging God. We prayed and begged God. Lord, help our church members get involved in soul winning. I've been preaching it for 10 years. I don't know how else to say it. It don't matter how much money you put in the plate for missions. If you don't go soul winning, you're in disobedience. If you don't witness, you're disobedient. If you're not a witness in your Jerusalem, in your Judea, and in your Samaria, it don't matter how much money you send to the uttermost parts of the earth, you're not obedient. We talked about that this morning almost exclusively for probably an hour and a half. What can we do to get the members of Calvary Baptist Church on board with local evangelism, personal evangelism,